Hey, good morning, FBC. Uh, it's really good to be with you again. I know um, still in my office, but uh, just a reminder, we will be back together live in the sanctuary next week, and you are welcome to join us for that. And of course, we will be uh, streaming online as well. So if you prefer to be home and uh, join us that way, that's terrific. We uh, just love to have you join us any way that you can. Uh, we're turning now to uh, God's Word, and we do believe the Bible is God's Word, and so we're going to take some time to try to understand what he is saying out of, uh, uh, this week we'll be looking out of the Book of Romans, and uh, written by the Apostle Paul, and we'll be taking uh, some look at what that has to say, and then finding principles that uh, are really helpful for us in our daily life today, and then applying those principles to our lives. Well, I want to start by asking a question. Um, have you ever been to Disneyland? I, I grew up going to Disneyland. I loved going to Disneyland as a kid. I'm from the West Coast. I had lots of family that lived in the Los Angeles area, still do. And I uh, love going to Disneyland as a little kid when I had the chance. And I was just, especially as a little guy, I was just absolutely in awe of Disneyland. I, I remember going on the Peter Pan ride, and I was just certain that we were actually flying over London. And uh, I would always want to end our day at Disneyland by going on the submarine ride, because I was just certain that we were going into the depths of the Pacific Ocean. But of course, the best part for me always was whenever I could see royalty, right? I'd come around this corner, and there... He was live and in the fur, Mickey Mouse. And I would be so excited. I'd shake his hand, give him hugs, give him high fives. And it would just be awesome to actually be able to see the real Mickey Mouse. Uh, and then what was really cool is that Mickey Mouse wanted to be my friend because he followed me everywhere, right? It didn't matter what part of the park we were going to. He'd turn a corner and there's Mickey again and, and go to another part of the park and there, there was Mickey again. And, I, you know, Certainly Mickey was actually following me because he wanted to be my friend. And so that was just, that was just really cool. See, when you go to Disneyland as a child, everything you see is just awe-inspiring. It seems so real and you have no idea that you're seeing only a fraction of the activity that's taking place around you that you never really get to see. And I began to understand that just how much of that was taking place. When I got a lot older and as an adult, I read a book about the behind the scenes world of Disneyland and all the stuff that was going on that those who visited Disneyland will never see, but it's meant to keep the sense of awe alive for their guests. So for example, uh, they have miles and miles of tunnels that run underneath Disneyland and come out in like these hidden doorways, these hidden passages all throughout the park. And that's so they can transport people, equipment, cleaning supplies, things like that in, in ways that are completely out of sight for anyone who is there. It's also what they use. So people in the costumes can pop out of those tunnels at different points in the park and everything is meticulously coordinated. So. You don't have Mickey popping out at different places at different time or at the same time, and and it all can be realistic. And and what I didn't know is the people in those costumes are only in those costumes in public for about 15 minutes at a time, and then they go back into those tunnels to make sure they don't overheat. So everything is just meticulously coordinated, so that as a guest, you are constantly in awe of what you are seeing. As we come to Romans chapter 11, we are encountering a situation where there is a sense in which the people of Paul's time were in awe of something, but they were in awe of something in the negative way, in the way that we often are. They, they were seeing a concern that just seemed huge to them, just an, almost an awe-inspiring concern. And it was a level of concern that you get to that you say, I don't know how to make sense of this and still consider God to be faithful. And so we're going to look at how Paul addresses that. And we're going to look then at principles that will help us as we think about things in our own situation uh, where we might be challenged to question God's faithfulness. Well, to really understand what is happening here, let's set the context a little bit. 
since the beginning of chapter 9, Paul has been addressing an issue that has uh, been a concern for the Church of Rome. And the Church of Rome is made up of both Jews and Gentiles. And Paul is now specifically addressing some concerns that would be concerns to Jews. And that is, okay, Jesus came and he was supposed to be the Messiah and he's supposed to be the promised savior to the Jewish people, but the Jewish people rejected him. And, and that's a big deal for a couple of reasons. One is it might cause you to question, was Jesus really the promised savior? And the second is it might question you to, ca- to question God's faithfulness, right? If, if, if God was supposed to send a savior to his people and he doesn't actually save his people, then what does that say about God? And Paul, since the beginning of chapter 9, has been addressing different forms of that question. He's been taking it in parts to really meticulously work through it. So this chart just helps us um, catch up a little bit on what Paul has said. In the first part of chapter 9, the form, the question that he specifically answered was, did God's word fail? In other words, God's word came to the Jews and the Jews rejected it. Does that mean that God's word was a failure? And And Paul addressed the question by saying, absolutely not. God's word did not fail. In fact, the problem was that they relied on being born descendants of Abraham as opposed to actually believing the word of God. And so he pulls out of that, and we pulled out of that the principle that that the way to righteousness is not through all the great things that you do or keeping all the rules, but it's by uh, your actual belief in Jesus Christ. And that is what makes you right with God. The next issue that Paul uh, dealt with is, is God unjust? Was God unfair for um, the fact that not everyone out of the descendants of Abraham were going to be uh, a part of, ultimately a part of uh, what God was doing through Jesus? And um, Paul says, absolutely not. God is not unfair. In fact, God is completely sovereign. He is completely in control, but he is always in every moment completely merciful. So as God acts out his sovereignty, he does so in a way that is merciful. And how those two goes to go together is, is really beyond our comprehension. But Paul argues that they can never be separated. And so we don't have to worry about God being unjust or unfair. The next issue is, I, I didn't know how else to put this, but is God absurd? See, from the perspective of that original audience, here's the situation. You have these Jews that work so hard to keep all the rules, do everything right, and yet they didn't find righteousness. And these Gentiles who really weren't looking for righteousness, they found it. And that just would have sounded absurd to the Jews of Paul's day. And Paul responds, God is not absurd. The problem was that Israel was trying to earn God's uh, acceptance, while the Gentiles, what they realized and connected with is they needed just to respond in faith to Jesus and what he had done on the cross uh, and was raised three days later. And we saw from that that if you're trying to rely on works and earn God's favor, it just turns into a type of legalism that you can't bear under and that no one else can bear under as well. Then last week, there's the question of, is God negligent, right? God sent out his word to people, but maybe he didn't do it effectively. Maybe maybe uh, he didn't reach everyone or maybe uh, the way that it was communicated wasn't effective. And Paul says, absolutely not. God did everything that was necessary to pursue his people. The problem was that there was a heart issue with his people. That's what kept them from receiving the message that God very faithfully put out. So that's where we've been. And this week, uh, we're going to look at the question of whether or not God has completely rejected Israel, leaving them without hope. And Paul is going to say, absolutely not. God is preserving graciously uh, Israel. And uh, yet there is still a heart problem that has to be accounted for. So as we work through this passage, we're going to see both of those, God's gracious uh, preservation of Israel, the heart problem that uh, still persists for much of Israel, and then we'll wrap up by looking at some uh, applicational principles that will help us. Let's first look at God's gracious preservation of Israel, which we see in verses 1 through 6. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. 
But what does God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it's by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. So the first way that Paul shows that God is preserving an, a, a, his people, a remnant, is by pointing to himself. And there's something that's important to catch here. Paul is saying, for I myself am Israelite, a descendant of Abraham. Now, the reason that Paul points out that he's a descendant of Abraham is because the nature of the question that Paul is trying to answer here is, God made these promises to Abraham, to bless Abraham, to bless his descendants, to send them a Messiah, a Savior. And so what about the actual physical blood descendants of Abraham? Are they, are they rejected? And Paul is saying, absolutely not. And as proof, look at me. I am one of those. I'm one of those descendants. In fact, I can tell you which part of the line of Abraham that I come from. So that's the first thing. He, Paul points at himself and says that God clearly has been faithful because I'm an example of that. But of course, he's just one person. So Paul then has to go uh, bigger than that. And what Paul does is he looks at the overall pattern for how God has related to Israel, and he points to an example specifically of Elijah. Verse 3 reminds us of what the situation was in Elijah's time. Elijah thought that he was all alone. In fact, Israel had completely rejected God's prophets. They had demolished the very places that you would worship God. And so Elijah, from his perspective, thinks he is completely alone. He is the last faithful person to God on the planet. And guess what? If things go the way of Israel, he's going to die and there will be no one left. And Paul reminds the people in Rome that Elijah's perspective was profoundly limited. That what he needed to be reminded of was that God was at work behind the scenes. There were things that Elijah didn't see. There were 7,000 men, and that's probably 7,000 men plus their wives, plus their children, who in fact never worshipped this false god. They remained faithful to the true God, but it was not something that Elijah was aware of. It was hidden from him. And then Paul takes this exact same principle and says what happened in Elijah's time, that is what hap is happening in Paul's time as well. There is a remnant, just like there were 7,000. God, in Paul's time, was preserving a number of people, descendants of Abraham, who would carry on and receive the fulfillment of the promises that God has made. And they were chosen not because they earned it, because they did something special, they were somehow better than the rest of the people. They were chosen by God simply by grace. And so Paul is reinforcing what he has said all along, that God is graciously at work behind the scenes. You see, if you looked at Elijah's time, and you looked at what Elijah saw, Elijah would only have seen this much of the picture. And God has to remind him that that perspective, that this much, was very misleading. He was only seeing a small part of it. And Paul says that, that is same thing is true in his day. And the same thing is true in our day as well. We have to be careful to avoid this exact same mistake, right? It's easy to look at our situation as a nation or, or in our families or in our personal lives and see this much and draw the conclusion that God has rejected us. I, I, I hear that a lot as a pastor, right? I hear people saying things like, look at what's happening in America and how America is turning away and, and God must be rejecting not only our country, but, but he must be getting ready to reject the whole world. Or probably the most common version of it that I hear is, we are one generation away from Christianity being wiped out from the planet. Well, what's the problem with that perspective? It's only looking at this much. It's looking at what's happening in the United States and, and completely missing what is hidden from us that God is doing throughout the entire world. The fact is we are living at a time of the single greatest revival in world history. It's just not happening here. 
It's happening in pe with people and in places that we are not seeing, but God is faithfully at work. And the same principle applies as we face challenges in our families, face challenges in our personal lives where we are tempted to question as God is faithful. We are reminded that God is working behind the scenes. Paul's point in these first six verses is that God has not, in fact, rejected Israel. He gives two types of proof. First, he himself is an example that God has not rejected Israel. And second, he points to God's pattern. God's pattern has always been that he preserves a remnant, even when things look horribly dark, when things look horribly hopeless. Well, the question still remains, I mean, in Elijah's day, there were a lot more Israelites than just 7,000 people. And in Paul's day, you know, kind of by the same principle, there are going to be a lot more people than who God graciously preserves as part of the remnant. And so Paul now turns to address that. What about those folks that are not part of the remnant? What's going on with them? He's actually going to come back, go back to the same thing that he talked about last week uh, with the challenges in people's hearts. So verses 7 through 10 say this, What then? Israel failed to attain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear, down to this very day. And David says, Let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and bend their backs forever. So what's Paul saying here? He is saying, basically, if you really understand with what he means by hardening, that these people wanted to be independent from God. And the curse that they received is they got what they wanted. They got the curse of being independent from God. Now, Paul makes it clear that there are two groups here, right? There's the elect and there's the hardened. The elect are those people he's just talked about in verses one through six. That's the remnant. The hardened is everyone else. And let's remember what we've said already as we've studied Romans about what it means for God to harden hearts. It means that God gives them over to what it is that they want. And the classic example of that that would have come to mind for every person in Paul's day who would have heard this, uh, who would have heard this passage would have been the story of Pharaoh and releasing Israel from their slavery in Egypt. And remember what took place there. God gives a series of signs, a series of plagues that are, that are meant to kind of move Pharaoh from, uh, from his reluctance to let Israel be released from slavery. And after every one of the first five plagues, what does it say? It says that Pharaoh hardened his heart. And then after the sixth plague, then it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. See, the pattern was Pharaoh hardened his heart and hardened his heart and hardened his heart. And then God finally said, I'm going to give you over to what it is that you want. You don't want to deal with me. You don't want to do what I'm asking you to do. You want to be independent of me. And so I'm going to give you over to that. And that is exactly what Paul is saying happens here. Paul explains that in a little more detail in verses 8 through 10, and he does so by quoting from the Old Testament. And, and in verse 8, he actually puts together a quote from Deuteronomy and a quote from Isaiah, and he's driving home the point that God is active in the process. And in so doing, he shows us how it is that God hardens hearts. Notice specifically what it says. It says that the eyes would not be able to see and the ears would not be able to hear. There's a spirit of stupor, in other words, a spirit of not understanding. So what Paul is talking about here is God continues to reveal his wonder and glory and beauty that is so appealing to us. But there comes a point when, when someone has hardened their heart so much that God just finally says, I'm no longer going to make it possible for you to see the wonder and glory and beauty of who I am and who my son is as it is revealed to you in scripture, as it is revealed to you in the world around you, as it's revealed to you in his people. Uh, verses 9 and 10 kind of pick up that same theme. Uh, here he's quoting from Psalm 69, and Psalm 69 is a psalm where David is crying out for God's help because his, because his enemies are trying to kill him. And so that's what you're seeing here. David is crying out to God, let their table, his enemy's table, become a snare and a trap. 
Why does he say that? Well, just before this in Psalm 69, David has said, they're trying to poison me through food and water. And so David is saying, do to them the very thing that they are wanting to do to me. Isn't it fascinating that Paul takes these people with hardened hearts and he puts them in the role of David's enemies and he puts God in the role of David. So it's like these people are saying to God, they are just, they're completely against him, just like David's enemies were against, against him. And they are things that they want to do to oppose God. And just like there were things that David's enemies wanted to do to oppose him. And so Paul's using this almost to say what God is going to do is exactly what David asked God to do. God is going to do to his enemies the very things that the enemies want to do to God. And uh, that is, they want nothing to do with God. They want to push God away. And so God is going to say, okay, I will give you that very thing that you want. So what's Paul talking about in these verses? What's he describing? He is describing someone who is absolutely set on being independent from God. In fact, they are so independent from God that they are completely against God. And at some point, God just says, I'm going to let them have what they want. I'm going to let them have that independence. And that is the ultimate curse. And the way he does it is by making the wonder and beauty and glory of his revelation impossible for them to comprehend, to see how wonderful and beautiful it is. And I've seen that at work in people's lives. I've, I've seen people who know the Bible well, they can quote the Bible, yet they are against God and they cannot see in Scripture anything wonderful and beautiful about who, God's, who God is. I actually knew someone who understood what the Bible taught about heaven, and her response was she could not imagine anything good about heaven because God was there. That's the most extreme example I think I've ever run into, but this was someone whose heart had become so hardened, it was impossible for her to look at the truth of God's word. It was impossible for her to look at, at God's glorious creation around her and see anything that was even wonderful or beautiful or good about who God is. What is it that the people of um, Paul's time saw? They looked around and they saw, okay, Paul himself is a believer. That's a good sign. But all of these other people who are Jews, who are part of Abraham's descendants, they are not included in this. And so they start to question, understandably, the faithfulness of God. What does Paul do? Paul broadens their perspective on reality and says there is a reality that they can't see. That God, in fact, just as he has always done, is preserving his people, despite the fact that so many of his people have completely rejected God and have rejected God to the point of being his enemy and rejected God to the point of saying, I want to be completely independent of you. And God's saying, okay, then I will give it to you. That's what's going on here. And so we have to raise the question of how is it that this can relate to us and where we are at? And I'd like to kind of help us move in that direction by looking at two principles. The first is God is doing more than what you see. And this passage really brings that out, right? It really brings out the limitations of our perspective. Because what the people at that point saw was there's Paul, and then there are all of these people who have uh, rejected Jesus as Messiah. And, and they look at what they see and, and they wonder what God is doing and where God, what God's character is like. And what Paul has to do is say, but there is so much more that you do not see. You do not see the remnant that God has preserved and you do not see the hearts of the people who have rejected God. And we need the perspective that God is in ways that we cannot see working out to accomplish his purposes, to keep his promise, and to preserve his people. And I saw an extraordinary example of that that I will never forget. Uh, just a few months ago, I stood by the bedside of a woman who was dying. She could not communicate with, with anyone around her. No one could communicate with her seemingly. She, uh, she, she just could lay there. And yet it was so clear to me at a very deep level that God was powerfully present 
with this person. I felt like I was standing on sacred ground. You see, from a human perspective, we look at that and we say, what's the point? Why? There, there's nothing that can be said to her. There's nothing she can say to us. What, what is the point? But yet God does not suffer our limitations. And I, who is completely at peace in my spirit, that, that God was with her in a very powerful and present way. Because God is not limited by the limitations of our body or our physical, uh, our, our physical breakdown. God was at work in her in a way that it would be impossible for me to see what was going on. There is a bigger picture than what is going on in your life, in your job, in wearing masks or not wearing masks, in staying at home orders, in, in just the rebelliousness that we see in our society, the rebelliousness that we experience within our own families. There's more that's going on than the disappointing uh, change of plans that all of us are experiencing in our lives. We've got to remember that we don't see the picture, but God does, and God is faithful. One of the things that we can do to help us in those moments where we're questioning the faithfulness of God is to recall the faithfulness of God that we have seen in the past. How have you seen God's faithfulness this year? How has he surprised you with his faithfulness this year? Because that's what he's going to do in the situation you're in now. Affirm God's faithfulness that you cannot see by remembering the faithfulness that you have seen. The second principle is that the battle for independence continues to wage on inside of us, even after we are Christians. Paul has spent the first eight chapters comforting us and assuring us that as followers of Christ, we are no longer slaves to sin. Yet he has also warned us that the temptations to sin, the temptation to be independent of God, continue to pull at us. And, and I want to unpack that a little bit because I think it's really important. You see, independence from God is, is really one of the most helpful ways to looking at the very heart of sin. When we speak badly behind someone's back, we know it's sin, but why do we do it? Well, we're trying to meet our emotional needs at someone else's expense. God's provided any number of ways to meet those very emotional needs, our, our sense for our need for connection, our need to be valued, our, our need to be secure in relationships. But, but when we put someone down, we are saying that, that we're going to meet those needs independently from God. We're, we're doing it in our own way. So, and that's true with every time we sin. I think there's one other way that we kind of assert our independence that's important for us to catch. Every time we think that we can earn God's acceptance through checking off all the right boxes, for being a good person, for doing all the right things, we are basically saying we can live up to God's standards and we can earn a relationship with him independent of God, independent of his plan, which was through the death of Christ on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins and his resurrection three days later. And we're saying, that I don't need that. I can do it on my own. Or as believers, we do the same thing. We say, I don't need the Holy Spirit at work in me. I can just go apply these principles to life and things will go great. That's why I'm so careful that when we do a sermon, it's really important that you leave here not saying, I'm revved up, ready to go up, uh, just accomplish these things for God. What I want you to come out of here with is a greater sense or a reminder of who God is so that you leave here recharged and energized about what God is doing in you and through you, not about what you accomplish independently of God. Just think about in your life how little we, we recognize our daily dependence upon God. Think about all the things that we do every single day that we just think about doing them on our own and doing them on our own strength and our own power. And it's as if God's blessing and God's work in our life is completely absent. One of the images that's helpful for me is to think about this like a knob every day, all day long. I'm turning this knob either more in the direction of being independent of God or more in the direction of being of recognizing my dependence on God. And there are lots of ways that I turn that little knob towards being independent of God. And almost always, in fact, I think always, it involves me believing a lie about God. Uh, it'll be something like, um, 
I don't believe that I can trust God with my emotional well-being, and so I'm going to gossip about this person so it makes me feel better. I'm going to be in, I'm going to be independent of what God wants in that way. Or it might be, um, I, I believe that my security is based on my income, and so I'm going to just lean into greed in my life. And, and really try to hoard and, and not be generous with the people around me. And every time I do that, I, I turn the knob towards being independent just a little bit more. Well, how do we counter that in our lives? We counter that by countering the lies that we're believing about God and then acting on the truth about God. So, for example, when I'm confronted with an opportunity to give generously, to uh, support what God is doing around the world or in our own community. And I actually say, I'm going to give towards that. What I'm doing is I'm acting out the truth about God. And the truth about God is that he can be trusted to be faithful, to care for me. And so I act that out and the Holy Spirit takes that and he turns the knob just a little bit towards being dependent on God. When, when I'm confronted with something and, and the temptation is to lie, to protect myself, but instead what I do is say, I can trust that what is true of God is that he will protect me and he will preserve me, even if I pay a high price and I tell the truth instead of telling a lie. The Holy Spirit takes that and he turns the knob just a little bit more towards dependence on God and over time, what happens is that I become almost automatic in responding to a fallen and broken world in a way that reflects dependence on God instead of independence from God. What's going on behind the scenes? God is at work. God is at work faithfully delivering on everything that he has promised, on fulfilling his purposes, on preserving his people, he is doing far more than what you or I can see. And we are invited to trust his faithfulness. And that's exactly Paul's point to the Romans in this passage. It is that God is going to preserve his people, and in so doing, he is going to fulfill his purposes. And the implication for us in our day as we seek to implement that is that we need to trust that God is faithful behind the scenes, especially when it appears that he is not. I visited Disneyland just uh, a couple of years ago, and it was the first time in about 30 years, and I had a, just a great time. And I went on the Peter Pan ride, and I did not for one second actually believe that I was flying over London. And of course, I had to go on the submarine ride, and I did not for one second believe that I was diving to the depths of the Pacific Ocean. And um, I had to hang out with Mickey and Donald Duck and Goofy, and I did not for one second believe that I was actually meeting the real Mickey Mouse or Donald Duck or Goofy, but I was still in awe. What I was in awe of were all the things that were happening all around me that I could not see, but were making everything possible, that were working out detailed plans, that were had express incredible care and protection for everyone who is involved. I was in awe of what I could not see. And that is what Paul is inviting us to today. Be in awe of God's faithfulness, even when it appears that it is hidden. And a few things that will help us with that, that I wanted to leave us with is Again, I always want to encourage you to rewrite the passage in your own words because it will help you drive the truth of it deeper into your heart. Identify one area where you are questioning God's faithfulness. And we all have areas all the time where we question God's faithfulness. Then after you identify that area, take some time and reflect. Where have you seen God's faithfulness show up in your life in surprising ways? Because what you're doing there is you're, you're starting to counter the lies that you might be believing about God with the truth, that God is faithful and he is at work. And don't do this alone. Invite someone to join you in prayer about this. Invite someone to pray that you would have greater trust in God's faithfulness, even when it's hidden. And, and pray for them as well in whatever, whatever area they are struggling with.
And I do think that the appropriate way for us to end is to end in prayer because we are completely dependent upon God to drive these truths deeper into us so that we would live them out even almost automatically. And let's go before the Lord and pray in that way. Heavenly Father, we do acknowledge that very often we live as if you are uh, not faithful to us and we live as if we are independent from you. And we confess that, Lord, that that is a strong temptation and uh, it is something that we give into often. But Lord, we thank you that you offer your grace and forgiveness to us in every single time that we do that and that you are faithful to us and that you preserve us and you hang on to us and that you work out your purposes in our lives and you keep your promises to us even when we don't fully understand how that's going to play out. And Lord, what we ask for today is a greater trust, a greater confidence of your faithfulness, even when it is hidden. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So uh, as I said earlier, the most important thing for us to walk out of here is a, a clear understanding of who God is. So what have we said about who God is? We have said that God is faithfully at work behind the scenes, even when we don't see it. So how does that truth change how we live? Well, the charge for us is that we need to realize that this week we're going to face something that's going to challenge our understanding that God is faithful. And we need to be prepared for that. We need to prepare for that two ways. One is by starting to recall now how we have seen God's faithfulness in the past. And the other is deciding now that we will respond in dependence instead of in independence from God. Well, thank you for being a part of today. I look forward to connecting with you again next week, whether it's in person or whether it is online. Uh, it is still a blessing to be able to open God's word with you and see how he is at work in our lives. And I look forward to doing that again next week.